Caldwell County's Voting History, presentation by Judge Beverly Beal, retired, brought to you by Meadowood Studios and Caldwell Heritage Museum. Is everyone able to see the slideshow presentation? The slide you should see now is by beginning tallies, colon, voting history in Caldwell County. Uh, you'll see that it gives credit to, uh, to me, but more importantly, Judy H. Beal. Uh, I owe a great deal to her in many different ways. Most of you know that. But uh, on presenta this presentation, she has been my editor, my proofreader, and my researcher, and my uh, solid right hand. And I'm looking at her and saying thank you. There are others who played some roles in uh, regard to our presentation today. And they include Cindy Day, who is the... Uh, director of the museum, and uh, she uh, also did proofreading and now is doing the engineering portion of it. Uh, there are others, my son Andrew, and two of my former colleagues, uh, the Honorable Claude S. Sitton of Morrington, who is the director of the Burke County History Museum, and also my friend Bob Brady, who for so many years has been uh, a friend and a uh, and uh, has discussed uh, some of the issues with me that are relevant to what we say today. Uh, and I want to thank both of them. Uh, Todd was my mentor. And Bob was my law class uh, companion, and friend, and later my law partner when I practiced law. If you don't know anything about me, that's good. Now, moving on, uh, I want to uh, tell you that we will be trying to take a close look at the voting habits of the electorate of Caldwell County from the creation of the county until the present day, or at least six, four years ago, uh, in order to see what this county's habits have been in regard to voting. Uh, a county is a convenient geographical area for government uh, organization, and it comes to us from, from England, uh, I think they call them cantons in Switzerland, uh, provinces in France. Uh, so many different names are given to the organization of a, of a government. Uh, and ours is unique when you really think about it. We're going to talk just a little bit about background information. And we will then move on to a <clears throat> review of the election history of Caldwell County. Now, please remember. The most important thing here is Caldwell County and its voting record by political parties. We will ignore totally, well, almost totally, North Carolina voting history. You're not going to hear me give you the, which candidate won in the elections by the state of North Carolina. And there's a reason for that. And I'll show you in just a minute why. I have to give some more credits to <clears throat> personnel that, uh, that uh, helped do this and initiate it, really. But first, let's just take a little quiz here. Uh, and uh, some of these questions will be answered in our presentation today. But <clears throat> let's let you think about your own history. In what city, state, and county did you cast your first vote? Now, for Larry Freeman, I will venture to say it was in the state of New York. Larry, am I right? Can you, well, I don't guess you can answer that and I can't see you. Uh, and what happened to voting during the Civil War in Caldwell County? What happened to voting after the Civil War? The Civil War is a watershed of events in our history. <clears throat> it cannot be ignored. It, it, it happened. Uh, there's a great deal of tragedy and sadness associated with it. But right now, we're going to look at the political outcome, the political changes, if there were any. You'll have to decide for yourself about some of those things. When your grandfather first voted, could your grandmother vote? Myra Dixon, do you know the answer to that? Probably not. She couldn't vote, your grandmother. Uh, what? Uh, who did you vote for in 1972? Well, some of you are too young, like Gene Branch. You have no idea because you weren't born yet. At what age could you begin voting when the time came for you to be a voting citizen? 
Now, a question we will answer eventually, but I'll leave you on the hook for this one. Can persons convicted of crimes vote? We'll get to it. If I don't get to it, uh, Sandy will remind me, or, or my wife, Judy, will remind me. Now, we do uh, solicit your questions, but here's how we're going to do this. Is the chat the box down there allows you to enter a, a dialogue and send questions. We'll not answer the questions during the presentation. They will be accumulated. We're going to try to set aside 15 minutes to answer some of the questions. Uh, after that, I become very boring. Uh, but we will have your questions, preserve your questions, and eventually can answer them by email uh, or in some other way. So if you have a question, uh, write it down or enter it into the chat box, and eventually we'll get to it. Now, let me do this. Let me talk about where do we look for information. And I want to mention a very important name here, Jeffrey Skelly. He is an election analyst. Uh, he is, has worked at different universities and different institutions. Jeffrey Skelly, about two years ago, published a listing of the voting of Caldwell County and all the other counties of, of North Carolina by county, by party. That is a huge task that he undertook, and he did a wonderful job. I think it is, I know it is on the internet. My son, Andrew, one of my editorial staff members, sent it to me, and then I could not uh, find any way to cut and paste the limitation to Caldwell County. So Mr. Skelly helped me with that. I sent word through him, and he did it for me. So we owe a lot to him. Look him up, and uh, we will be able, I believe, without uh, further permissions necessary, to publish that online. I will try to do so. I think you'll find that uh, interesting. I know Sonny Hines uh, is from the eastern part of the state, so Sonny voted in some other county in his first time out or for most of his life. He wants to know how North Carolina, North Carolinians in his home county voted. I know he does. I can see it in his face. So we'll, uh, we'll try to answer that question that, San, uh, that uh, Sonny did not ask. Now, the Lenore News Topic archives are here at the museum. The printed versions of the Lenore News Topic from 1991 back 100 years are here on paper in our library. If you want to do research, the paper is very delicate, but you can come up here and pull down a book and you can study them and look at the headlines yourself. Uh, there are state archives that help us with this. There are independent studies and articles online. Our elders, uh, what I tell you today will partially come from my elders, my parents. Uh, our library has the book by Nancy Alexander, Here Will I Dwell. This is a research library, but you're welcome to come up here to the museum and look at it. Wikipedia, Ballotpedia, uh, constitutioncenter.org, uh, other uh, online resources. And one other item that is very important, in 1992, the University of North Carolina Law Review was published, and it was a symposium on the Constitution of North Carolina, and Professor John Orth, I had an article on North Carolina constitutional history, which I have read over and over again. His article, which is about 20 or 30 pages, uh, is very, very instructive, and I commend it to you, and, and I have a copy at home. And then an article on history.com about women's suffrage. Yeah. So let's go. Uh, let's talk about Caldwell County history briefly. The county was formed in 1841. About a two-year battle occurred to create Caldwell County. It came from parts of Burke and Wilkes counties. The previous divisions included, if you go back far enough, Rowan County and Surrey County. Uh, the North Carolina history of creation of counties is a matter of venturing from East Coast to the western far part of the state now. Uh, the Large counties became smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, it would take 10 years for the city of Lenore to be chartered and become the county seat of Caldwell County. It really 
found, was founded in 1841, but it was 1851 before it was chartered by the legislature, by the General Assembly. Now, we talked about our sources of information. The law that governs, governs elections in North Carolina, from whence does it come? The Constitution of North Carolina. Now, we're talking about presidential elections. And you say, well, why don't you mention the Constitution of the United States first? I'll tell you why in just a moment. Uh, but the Constitution of North Carolina, the North Carolina General Statutes, those are the compiled uh, laws of North Carolina as enacted by the General Assembly. The precedents established by decisions of the Supreme Court of North Carolina. Uh, we don't have time to discuss the presidential concept of common law, but there it is, and uh, I'll do that on another occasion. Now, the Constitution and the election of a president of the United States, of course, is important about how it's done. Article 2, Section 1, Part 2 of the, of the United States Constitution. This is the original Constitution, was superseded by the 12th Amendment. Now, this is the part of this Constitution where there is a great deal of detail uh, about the Electoral College. And the 12th Amendment uh, was uh, a modification of that. But in the first part, it was the, man, the person who got the most electoral votes became president, and the person with the second most electoral votes became vice president. They did not have to be, and usually were not, of the same political party. Well, that was corrected by the 12th Amendment because it was obviously not going to work out. Uh, and so it was like a marriage that was not made in heaven. But uh, that was amended with some other amendments. Uh, and it was also affected by uh, the uh, amendments to the Constitution 15, 19, 22, 24, and 26. And we'll discuss some of those as we go along. But nowhere in there does it say, nowhere can I find a provision that there shall be a popular vote of the people of the nation for the offices of president and vice president. There is no place that says there shall be a popular vote. We are accustomed to the idea that the electors elect based on the vote of the people of the state. That is entirely up to the states. There is nothing I have yet found that says that a state must have a popular vote. And that was not the idea initially. Uh, electors voted the way they liked it. Uh, in 1835 and 1868, there were massive overhauls of the North Carolina Constitution. There you have some more instructions on those subjects. Now, the political eras of North Carolina. Well, the, the, you know Native Americans had their tribal governments. How they operated that, who knows? It might have been uh, the, the meanest man in the crowd became the chief. I don't know how they did it. Uh, trial by ordeal, perhaps. Uh, then we have the era of European discovery and settlement, which included the proprietary colony period, and the royal colony period. And on those, um, in those two forms, there were uh, others deciding who would be the governor or agents uh, of the owners uh, to establish and maintain a government in each case. It's a very interesting story about the proprietors and government in North Car in Carolina, but we won't go there now. In 1776, our state was in rebellion, and that was the first Constitution of North Carolina. It was a combination document. I believe it was the Article of Mecklenburg, uh, Articles, the Mecklenburg Declaration. Uh, and, and it was a combination document, a Declaration of Independence and the first Constitution, which still was in place in, until 1835, pretty much as it was originally created. After the Revolution, North Carolina and all the other states considered themselves independent states. That's the word state equals nation. But they were members of the Confederation under the Articles of Confederation. And you're asking now, and I'm answering, how, how did North Carolina 
a vote in every election uh, uh, throughout the period of time when there were elections and popular votes. North Carolina has adhered uh, since 1868 to popular votes as a, as a, man, as a mandate in many ways. Before that, there were very few public officials who were actually elected by popular vote. The legislature appointed the governor. The legislator, uh, legislators appointed the local justices of the peace, also called the county court. The county court ran the county, and they were uh, wealthy individuals, always men, by the way, who uh, were so uh, involved in the local government uh, or local affairs, they were selected justices of the peace, and they ran the county until they died. So for you to find out about the others, I suggest you do your homework. And I'll leave it there. And Mr. Skelly's work is a basic place to go. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. And we thank him very much. Independence. This idea of independence uh, was uh, to North Carolina. Uh, the idea that the, that the Constitution of North Carolina was important. The Articles of the Confederation lasted for about eight years, and it was totally worthless. Constitution of the United States came along, and when we come back to it, the Constitution of North Carolina. Under those two constitutions, we now operate our government uh, for North Carolina. The birth of a county. As I said, in 1841, they took some of Wilkes, or the best part of Wilkes, I think, and the best part of Burke County, although Claude Sitton better not hear I said that. As a separate county, uh, the uh, first election in which Caldwell County voters could vote for President of the United States occurred in 1844. Now, 1841 creation, 1844 first election. Here is a, a, a line drawing of uh, Caldwell County, and uh, it, it, uh, it is what a lot of what you see there was what you would have seen so many years ago. Now I'm going to give you a sample of how this is going to look on your screen. We're looking at uh, a chart uh, on the left, the year of the election, and next, the party prevailing in Caldwell County. Remember, this is about party politics to a great extent, what we're doing on this particular occasion. The party's candidate. The Whig Party was the was the, a uh, party that was formed out of several defunct parties, amalgamated is a good word, the Federalist Party, the Whig Party, uh, sometimes is said to be the ancestor of the Republican Party of today. It is impossible to make that generalization correctly. Uh, the, you cannot say with any certainty that the Whig Party of that day uh, is exactly the Republican Party of today. That just doesn't work. Uh, there's so much history there. The party's candidate was Henry Clay, a name well known to you. The national winner was James Polk. And this uh, this uh, uh, screen I'm looking at has to be moved. Uh, the opponent who lost was Clay, the Whig, and James Polk, the Democrat, was the winner of the election. Now, let me do it another way and say it this way. In 1844, Caldwell County voted for the Whig candidate, Henry Clay. The winner of the election was, and I've just told you, but a little drama is helpful here. So here we go. James K. Polk, a Democrat. Another name familiar to you, born in North Carolina. So there you see the results depicted in several ways of the election of 1844 for president and the results of Caldwell County in that election. So let's proceed. The Whig Party was a political party active in the middle of the 19th century, and uh, the Democratic Party was slightly larger. The Whig Party came and it went, but it was the home of four presidents of the United States, but only three of them were elected. I'll explain that in just a moment, as soon as I get my face out of the way here. So here's the first chart that I want you to see. In 1844, the results we have uh, spoken about. 1848, again, Caldwell County voted for the Whig candidate. This time it was Zachary Taylor. Well, Zachary Taylor, bless his heart, passed away in 1850. And Millard Fillmore, 
the vice president succeeded him. He was a Whig also. He was never elected president of the United States. In 1848, uh, Zachary Taylor did win, and uh, the opposing candidate was named Lewis. Now, by the way, let me remind you that this, this presentation is being recorded, and it is our intent to place it on our Facebook page so that anyone can go back and see the complete uh, presentation and see all of these charts at that time. Uh, so uh, the, the loser was a Democrat named uh, Lewis. Lewis what? Let's see if I can get that out. Cass. Lewis Cass. Thank you. And then uh, the 1852 election, the Whig Party's candidate was the choice of Caldwell County, but look, his name is not Miller Fillmore. It's Winfield Scott, an Army officer. Uh, he was defeated by Franklin Pierce. So, oh, that's why I was uh, and hit the, uh, the loser was Winfield Scott, the Whig. So now you have Henry Clay, the Whig, Zachary Taylor, uh, who was a Whig, uh, Will Miller Fillmore, who was a Whig, and Winfield Scott. Four Whig presidents, and then the Whig party disappears from the political uh, stage. Uh, but three of those were elected or not elected. North Carolina, uh, Caldwell County was not doing a good job of picking winners. Uh, the uh, first one was elected. Uh, the second one was elected. I should correct myself and say they were doing a pretty good job. Uh, Franklin Pierce uh, was the winner, uh, and Scott was defeated. That was the loser. Those are the four from 1844 to 1852. Merge, we go into another period of time. In 1856, the the issues related to the Civil War were festering. Slavery was a significant issue. Uh, my time on this earth and my study as a history major at Wake Forest and the information I've gained from reading books on the subject of the Civil War can convince me now that although sometimes it is talked about as an, as an economic issue, uh, a cultural issue, Race and slavery, slavery was the main issue uh, in this situation. In 1856, a lot of the future of the Civil War hung on that election, and Caldwell County voted for the Know Nothing Party candidate, Millard Fillmore. Millard changed horses. He's still in the, the, the stage, but the Whig Party's gone, but the Know Nothing Party was this uh, was a upstart. James Buchanan was the winner. And John Fremont, Mont, the, De the Democrat, and Miller Fillmore, the American or Know Nothing Party, was also vanquished in this election. Now we come to, and I'm going to explain about the Know Nothing Party a little, a little bit more in just a moment. 1860, the last election before the Civil War commenced, the Constitutional Union Party, John Bell was a candidate. Uh, that's B-E-L-L, -L, not to be confused with John Barclay Bell, B-E-A-L-L, -L, who is my age. Uh, his family spells their name as much as mine, but we could not afford the extra L. Now, Abraham Lincoln was the victim. Stephen Douglas was the Democrat who was vanquished, and of course, John Bell was vanquished in that election. Uh, in, in 1864, North Carolina was in the uh, Confederate States of America, uh, and therefore there was no vote for any uh, uh, Union candidate, but Abraham Lincoln, the Republican, won. Well, the Democrat lost. Abraham Lincoln was the very first Republican candidate. That party is more closely connected to the present-day Republican Party, but once again, I believe you cannot generalize about that. You just have to accept the fact that many 
changes have occurred over the period of time since then till now, and you just cannot make the generalization that it's the same party. Uh, so we didn't vote in the 1864 election. Now about the American or Northern Party. Here you see a very brief description. It was called, it was a Native American party. Uh, and uh, that uh, was known by that name before 1855. Uh, and the American party in 1855, but generally speaking, it was a no nothing, the know nothing party because its members were told to reply when someone said, what, what is the policy? What are the, what is the platform of the American party? And the answer was that all members were supposed to give is, I know nothing when asked about its specifics by outsiders. The Constitutional Union Party, this party represented the idea that we should remain. The Southern states should remain part of the United States. They wanted to avoid a, an issue uh, of slavery and not secede and reform. And these were people who were unhappy with the Republicans and the Democrats. I think it was a sincere desire in this part of the state, it appears, to, to not leave the Union. And the vote in Caldwell County is reflected is, is a reflection of that desire. And uh, at the feet of Dr. David Smiley, a his, history a professor who taught history of the South, I learned that the economic issues and the race issues were not so significant to the people of this area of the state, the mountains, as it was to the, land, the, the landowners, the plantation owners of the eastern part of the state. Uh, but when war did come, the idea was that we would stand with the other members of, of the white race, that, that the, the white people of the north of the west would stand with the white people of the east and, and would sign up and be members of uh, the Confederacy and would fight for the Confederacy. Uh, the Constitution Union Party. Uh, had a, uh, a, 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 there was another race between the Northern Democratic Party and the Southern Democratic Party that split them, and uh, ultimately Lincoln won the election by winning nearly every Northern electrical vo elect elected vote in 1860. Bell took 12.6 percent of the national national popular vote and carried three states in the Upper South, finished with the second highest vote total in each remaining slave state that held a popular vote. Not all the states held a popular vote. Not all of them did. So, in 1868, the Democratic candidate was the choice of Caldwell County. Horatio Seymour was the candidate, but U.S. Grant, the Republican, won the election and Seymour did not. Now we go into the period of time from 1868 when Caldwell County voted historically for Democrats for a, for a long period of time. And the candidates uh, of the uh, of the 1876 election, for example, Samuel Tilden was a Democrat. Rutherford B. Hayes uh, won the election, and Tilden did not. You'll recognize in that that the fourth uh, column names that you know were presidents, and in the column just to the left of that, you'll see names that were not. So there we have Democrat candidate took the majority of the votes in Caldwell County repeatedly uh, and the uh, the Republican candidates won. Uh, we go on down to 1900. Now, right there we have had a long string of Democrats being uh, the choice of Caldwell County and not being winners. Here we come, however, to 1900. The Republican Party took the county. That was William McKinley. For whatever reasons, I do not know right, right this moment why the change was made. We do know, of course, that he was assassinated. He beat William Jennings Bryan. And I don't know what it was. I have a feeling it was more about William Jennings Bryan not being the guy that Caldwell County wanted 
than it was that William McKinley was the fellow. But we come to the first instance where we see uh, a vice president not only succeeding the assassinated president of the United States, but also being the candidate of the party and also winning outright. So the Republican Party candidate, Theodore Roosevelt, was the choice of Caldwell County. And he did defeat the Democrat, Alton Parker. Well, here you have a Republican running for president of the United States, winning Caldwell County in 1904, Theodore Roosevelt, Petty. He was well known other than just by being vice president. I think the idea was, as I've read it in some place, that the Republican Party didn't really like Theodore Roosevelt. He had just been a a thorn in the side of the leadership of the Republican Party, and they couldn't figure out a way to deal with him until someone said, let's kick him upstairs. He can't possibly do any harm as vice president of the United States. They never do anything like it. They never, they, they, that's a dead-end job. Not so for Teddy. And he w- won that election. In 1908, Caldwell County again voted for a Republican, William Howard Taft. And he beat William Jennings Bryan. Again, William Jennings Bryan could be uh, an irritant to some people. Uh, he was he was a lawyer, and lawyers become irritants uh, often. Uh, there you are. Now, we, we've, we've seen that period up to 1908. In the next period of time we're going to look at, we're going to be looking at uh, the effect of the election on uh, uh, Caldwell County and the nation of Women's women's suffrage. Is it women's suffrage or women's suffrage? I don't know. Uh, I'll have to consult uh, Myra Dixon, our English scholar, in order to find that out. But on August 18th, 1920, now look, August 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified. There you can see it. And just a few months later, on November 2nd of that year, more than 8 million women across the United States voted in elections for the first time. I, I can speculate about why uh, that that issue was finally won and that amendment finally passed. Uh, I have a personal belief that at that point in American history, women were receiving the opportunity for a good education. And it was discovered that women actually, I'm saying this with tongue in cheek now, folks, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, that, that uh, women finally were not as ignorant as men thought they were. They were they were, had the, the capacity, just as we know they do now, to uh, be uh, highly educated and be leaders and be public servants, and that they had a right to vote. And that issue finally dawned on the men of the United States, and uh, they won that right. Uh, and I imagine that my my grandmother probably did vote in Lincoln County, uh, uh, both my grandmothers. The other one was in Mecklenburg County. They probably did vote. Uh, if they were anything like uh, their progeny, uh, they were people who would take a stand and fight a battle and get involved. On November 2nd, as I said, they did vote for the first time. Now we come to the period 1912-1928. Uh, the Democratic Party once again uh, was the, the county of cho- the party of choice for Caldwell County. Woodrow Wilson starts us off in 1912. He is the first Southerner to be elected president of the United States since the Civil War. This is, this is a, something of significance. He was a Virginian, but one of the reasons he was elected was that he also was, I believe, president of, of uh, Princeton University, a scholar. He had a typewriter that typed in ancient Greek symbols. Uh, and, and he'd sit down at the typewriter and type out something in, in Greek, and he could actually read it. Uh, my son John, who is, not, who is a musician, gets exasperated at our family meals when my son Andrew and I start speaking in Latin. Uh, I, that would just, it drives him nuts. Uh, and all I say to him is, omnia non sunt mudicandum pater necessitatem. 
Now, in 1916, he won again. Remember the motto, he kept us out of war. Uh, he was uh, the Democrat. He was the choice of Caldwell County. He was the national winner of the election. In 1920, we, we have fought a war. Uh, people are exhausted by that. The Republican Party prevailed in Caldwell County with Warren Gamaliel Harding. Now, Harding uh, was, I believe, from Ohio, and he had some, some issues that came up about his uh, personal ethics, I believe, but he, he prevailed. However, uh, there, were, there were a lot of things bumping along there, uh, 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 nature of questions about some corruption, I believe, in the administration, not by him perhaps, but by some other people in the administration. And on a trip to the West Coast by train, uh, he suffered what was called a stroke of apoplexy. I believe we now call it a stroke. Uh, it was a, 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 a terribly bad um, organic brain turmoil and uh, involving blood clots, that sort of thing, but he died. And uh, his, uh, Cal his Vice President Calvin Coolidge took the oath of office in his father's uh, kitchen up in New England. Uh, his father was a justice of the peace. Uh, and uh, that is uh, nostalgic for me because on the first occasion when I went, one, for the seat of Superior Court Caldwell, for Caldwell and Bur for the state of North Carolina, uh, my dear friend, Paul Sitton, ministered the oath to me in his kitchen on January the 1st of 1991 at, at early in the morning. Uh, and uh, I remember that uh, fondly. So Warren Harding was succeeded by Calvin Cooley. Uh, back to the Democrat Party comes Caldwell County. John Davis is a candidate. Calvin Coolidge is the victor. And uh, Davis and Robert LaFolle, a, I believe he was from Minnesota, from the Midwest, uh, was the progressive candidate who also lost. Then in 1928, Herbert Hoover comes along. Now, Herbert Hoover uh, uh, defeats Alfred Smith, Alfred E. Smith. And uh, the question is, uh, how did he do that uh, in Caldwell County? Uh, he was not known to the folks of Caldwell County. He had been involved in government in some positions in the national, uh, national government, but he, he was an engineer and a businessman. Uh, and he uh, was evidently a, a fine man, uh, a, a decent individual, but his understanding of political leadership, uh, leadership of government, is different from the leadership of, of uh, corporations and businesses. And along comes the Depression, and he couldn't cope with it. Uh, his motto was, Prosperity is just around the corner. As he began his campaign for 1932's election, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, a New Yorker, governor, former governor of New York, uh, a, a man who was articulate, who was extremely intelligent, and who had been involved in federal government. He was Secretary of the Navy, I believe, uh, in uh, World War I, uh, and he was just had such a sparkling sense of humor and a very memorable voice. He campaigned even though he had polio and was unable to actually walk very much. Uh, some authorities tell us, some medical authorities tell us that if he had devoted his full time and attention to rehabilitation and not undertaken his political life, he probably would have regained the ability to walk uh, unassisted. Uh, but that was not to happen because he made the sacrifice that he thought was necessary. And the only thing we have to fear is fear itself was a memorable line from his first inaugural address. Uh, he defeated Herbert Hoover and took control of the reins of government for more years than any other president ever did. There was only an unwritten rule about succession, and he did not abide by that rule. Later it became uh, 
a, the law as an amendment to the Constitution. But he was, in 32, dealing with the recession. And still, the recession persisted when, in 1936, he defeated Alf Landon. He was the candidate of choice of Caldwell County. And uh, I uh, dare say uh, Wills County, I'll tell you why I say that in just a moment, but 32, he was the county's choice. He was the nation's choice. Uh, he, he, uh, and my, my wife's grandmother, Pearl Church, who uh, was, uh, her maiden name was Pearl Church. Her husband's name was Odell Church. And they lived in Wilkes County. Well, you know, there are a lot of churches down there. They were so poor during the Depression, they had to make their own cough medicine. Anybody get that one? Okay. Uh, but uh, they, she said to me, more often than I can remember, but she said, Franklin Roosevelt saved the, lives, the lives of my family. That's what she said, and they were staunch supporters of Franklin Roosevelt, and he was able to, both by political savvy, good management, and an appealing personality bring us through that. And then we faced the World War II situation. And he guided this nation through that also. Uh, and he, he chose good people to assist him. Uh, and uh, he called on uh, he called on the people of North, of North Carolina and the United States to pitch in. During World War II, there are many of us whose ancestors served in the military. Uh, uh, my, uh, my father was a Secret Service agent during World War II. He just received a telegram one day and said, report to Washington. He did it, and he never told us anything more about his service during World War II. Now, uh, tragically, in 1945, President Roosevelt died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, at Warm Springs, Georgia. Uh, he was succeeded by Harry Truman. Harry Truman took the reins of government uh, and uh, unknown at that time to us, uh, he did not know of the existence of the atomic bomb. And he, in spite of the fact that he had been left out of the loop, he took charge, he made decisions, and he dealt with the uh, dealt with the history as he found it, and he guided this nation through the last days of the war. And those were difficult days, too. He had to deal with Stalin and Churchill. Both of them were truculent individuals, at least you might say that. Now we come to something that I have, I'll explain. If you don't know it, you, I know you do. In 1948, he ran for office. He was, he was the candidate of Caldwell County, and he defeated Thomas Dewey. Strom Thurmond, the Dixiecrat, and Henry Wallace, the Progressive. The winner was Harry Truman. But there is a famous photograph, I believe, published by the Chicago Tribune. I could not get permission to reproduce it here, but it is Truman holding up a banner headline, Dewey Defeats Truman. No, if, all, if any of you have seen it, raise your hands. I know you have. We, 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 if you're a history buff, you have seen that. Uh, Truman was the ninth candidate in 1948. Uh, he did not run again. He was elected. Another example of where a vice president has a little motiva uh, momentum going into an election, in most cases, uh, he won. He was able. He fought a lot of battles, uh, and he was from Missouri, so he was tough enough. Uh, and so we go on now to the 50s, and here we come to a period when Caldwell County okay, voted for the Republican, Dwight Eisenhower, as opposed to Adlai Stevenson from Illinois, the Democrat. Dwight Eisenhower was so well known because of his great service. He was a fine man, a great leader, a good friend, and a public servant to his nation. And he led the nation for two terms. He was Caldwell County's choice. Uh, and he was a good leader. And he stood up when it had to be done, called in federal marshals, and segregation was a major issue at that time. In 1960, 
Uh, he was no longer eligible to serve. The Republican Party candidate was Richard Nixon, and he was the, co- the choice of Colorado County. But John, Richard Nixon did not win that election. John Kennedy did from Massachusetts, and Nixon was the loser of that election. I believe that we come to a sea change in politics in Caldwell County and North Carolina at this time. The Democrat Party had prevailed overall with certain periods of Republican voting preference by Caldwell County voters. But we come to 1960, and I think that some circumstances, some issues uh, affected Caldwell County voters at that time. Uh, One matter that did come up is the 26th Amendment. And in 1964, just in time for me to graduate from high school, along with my wife, Judy, uh, Myra Dixon was still a child uh, at the time. Uh, I think she was a freshman uh, or maybe an eighth grader at that time. Now, the uh, rights of citizens who are 18 years of age to vote shall not be denied or abridged. Vote, voting age changed from 21 to 18. And uh, I became eligible to vote one year later, and I did. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson, another vice president, stepping into an awfully difficult situation, won the election uh, as the Democratic Party candidate, and he was the choice of Caldwell County. Barry Goldwater from what state? Arizona. Thank you, Judy. Arizona was the loser, uh, and uh, I remember at Wake Forest, I worked at the radio station and listening to his address uh, as the year 1964 began, Lyndon Johnson said he would neither seek nor accept the uh, nomination of his party for another term because the Vietnam War had been so unliked, so difficult for everyone. And so much committed to it that did not appear to be uh, worthwhile that he did not run. Richard Nixon was the choice of Caldwell County. He was, of course, the Republican. And he did win this election. And he won the next election. <clears throat> and then his situation went downhill because of uh, issues that gave rise to the uh, potential for impeachment. It would have been a nasty affair. But he did resign, and Gerald Ford, another decent man, another decent man, uh, was uh, the candidate in 19, I think I've skipped something, haven't I? In 1976, Jimmy Carter, another Southerner. Count the Southerners that have been elected since World War II on one hand. And my three fingers, I think. Uh, Gerald Ford did not win. Jimmy Carter did. Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, term was fraught with difficulties about uh, gasoline availability and price, a failed attempt to rescue hostages. Uh, he, 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 uh, he was also a good man. We've seen his, his uh, character shown since his election and since his term in office uh, with great, uh, a, a great, servant and 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 a a great individual but not in the role uh that we would wish he that that he he, we would wish he had been more successful ronald reagan a well-known actor and governor of california don't forget he was a governor of california he was a choice of caldwell county uh he had come here on an occasion to visit caldwell county he was a choice he won and jimmy carter lost the uh, next election, 84, again, the Republican Party, Ronald Reagan. 88, Republican Party, George H.W. Bush defeated Michael Dukakis. Uh, uh, 1992, Republican Party. Now we see uh, the change that has occurred in the political leanings of Caldwell County. Caldwell County, the Republican Party predominantly uh, uh, sway in local politics. Now, another thing that has to be remembered here is that in 19, uh, well, I have a note here. I just made it a moment ago. 
1963, Congressman James Broyhill began his long service to Caldwell County, North Carolina, and to the United States as uh, our representative in Congress. Uh, you may not remember that he did serve at the end of his distinguished career uh, as senator when Senator East uh, committed suicide. Uh, and then he retired uh, Senator Broyhill, the title to which he is entitled. Most people would say congressman, but he is entitled to be called senator. Uh, his, term, his, his service in public life ended, uh, and he was uh, entitled to enjoy uh, relaxation uh, and to return to his business interests uh, here in Lenore and Caldwell County and throughout the state. Uh, and he uh, was uh, well-liked, and that was one of the reasons, not only the candidates for president, but Mr. Broyhill, Senator Broyhill's service, that uh, did have an effect on Caldwell County's record of uh, voting Republican for many, many years, including Mr. Reagan, Mr. Bush, uh, and uh, John McCain, uh, and uh, Mitt Romney, and, and uh, Donald Trump in 2016. Now, I've reached the point where there's nothing else I want to say. You, you all know the results of these races. You know better than I do. Some of you have studied more carefully this period of time of our political past, and I'm not going to either try to uh, summarize facts, and I'm not going to express any opinions, uh, because uh, we come now to the year 2020, and what, pray tell, will happen now, we do not know, but we shall know uh, as time passes. We may not know until 12 days after Election Day, uh, when all of the ballots should be open, and results come. We may know on election day. I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, each of us has our own positions on that, and I'll leave it to you. Now, I hope this has been interesting. I'm going to stop right there very abruptly, perhaps, but that's where we're, we are, and uh, we've come up to the present. What we see is North Carolina's voting record uh, is not, as many people perceive it, to be dominated by uh, well, perhaps it is more correct to say, dominated by Democratic candidates winning in Caldwell County and then a sudden change to the Republican Party's dominance. Uh, that may be true, but I see it more as a checkered cloth uh, with different reasons, different people, different personalities, and different trends that have uh, been so related to cultural issues, economic issues, uh, personality issues, issues of war and peace, prosperity. All of these factors uh, have played a role in the voting record of Caldwell County. And to me, that shows that the voters of Caldwell County have paid attention. They have not been driven by personal gain, as some might think that's, the, that's what it happens uh, in politics. It's what have you done for me lately, as some Texas politician said when you talked about whether you would help somebody with their problems, the, uh, what have you done for me lately? That's not, that's not it. Uh, at least from my experience, that's not it. And it has not been so for either of the modern parties. We have Ross Perot, we have Ralph Nader, we have other factors that have entered into who was elected. Uh, we won't try to explore that either. Now, I've come to a point where I ought to shut up and be quiet. Uh, quiet. That's difficult for me, but I'll try. Now, have we had any questions? Oh, yes, I'm being reminded. I promised you. Here's the law of North Carolina in, in regard to the voting rights of, of people uh, convicted of crimes. First of all, a person who is convicted of a misdemeanor. Misdemeanors include driving while impaired, assault, simple assault, and some other forms of assault, uh, um, uh, other crimes that are, are of not the greater uh, uh, violence, those crimes, the uh, person convicted 
never loses citizenship rights and never is deprived of the right to vote. Convicted felons. Felons means murder, rape, arson, burglary. Uh, many, most of the drug charges, drug possession of drugs with a tit cell and deliver, trafficking in drugs, uh, uh, kidnapping, those kinds of crimes. Uh, they lose their rights to vote for the period of time that they serve an active sentence or for the period of time that they serve a probationary sentence. At the conclusion of their service of their sentences, the rights of a citizen are automatically restored and they can vote and they can serve on juries. Uh, those are the two most significant right and the right to hold office uh, but it's a temporary thing and uh, eventually if, uh, if they live, uh, they they resume and have their rights to of a citizen restored uh, however of course we do have uh, capital punishment and we do have life in prison without parole as potential sentences in some cases. Uh, so the answer is yes, temporarily their right to vote is, is revoked, but they can eventually have it restored automatically. Uh, Bill Tate may be wanting to know how to, to build a program for Volkswagen. I can't help you with that, Bill. Sorry. Uh, does anyone have any question about those last elections? Uh, Clinton, uh, Obama, uh, Trump, about the, the voting history there, anything like that. Larry Freeman, am I correct that you uh, that you got cast your first vote in the state of New York? If you did, raise your hand. You have to raise your hand because I can't hear you. Just raise you say yes, you did in New York State. Okay, uh, uh, that's what I thought. Um, Sonny Hines, uh, can we unmute Sonny? Sonny, what county did you cast your first vote in? Bev, I voted in Halifax County. Halifax. Halifax. Are there any other questions? We can unmute you, and you can unmute yourself now. If you think of a question you want to ask, uh, uh, call Lucy McCarl. I mean, no. Uh, but if you have a question you want to ask, some of you have my email address. The email address for the museum is... Caldwell Heritage Museum, 1841, at Gmail. The phone number up here is, well, I swear to goodness, I was about to say Plaza. <laughs> Plaza for 758-4004. 758-4004. Well, this has been an arduous task for all of us non-technical people. Uh, uh, my answer to some of these questions is a, is a in one carbine, right, Sonny? Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I appreciate y'all joining us. This is being recorded, and it should be on our Facebook page, which is Caldwell Heritage Museum. Put that in the search box, and you'll come up with us. And uh, if you have any trouble, call the phone number, and we'll guide you through that so you can see it again. Uh, and we're very happy. I appreciate y'all joining in. Uh, uh, we've done the best we can. Uh, this this is arduous, but I'm I feel better being a postage stamp image than being on, uh, live in my real size. Uh, it's better this way. Well, thank you, Neil. Fabulous. Happy Wonderful. I'm Sharia. Sure that I'm just devoting to the history of our county. Um, please vote uh, next week. Exactly. If you have not yet voted, it is our duty. Uh, our duty, our responsibility, and our responsibility and our duty, and our privilege. Our responsibility, our honor.
Can you know that we don't be no one then? This ends the offer visit. We are open in your hours and we'd love to see you just stop in. We do miss all, seeing all of you up here at the museum. Uh, I believe Bill Tate is also going to produce, if at all possible, technologically. Uh, if anybody can do it, Bill can uh, produce a, 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 this uh, manner for this uh, presentation also, and he'll give information about where and how it's available later on. And we thank him for that. Uh, Bill has been a stalwart. You all have enjoyed his photographs. I know over and over again. Uh, some of the pictures, though, uh, are, are uh, people like me and Sonny and Harriet when we were younger. Uh, and I don't know whether that's good or bad. Thank you all very much for being with us. Have a good day. Bye-bye.